It has been a while since I've had a VOD review out, but this is a pretty good one. So this is a deck I always come back to when I'm feeling a little bit bored of Gwent, which is kind of effectively what I've been feeling for a little bit. Uh, this Buying Calvate is pretty, uh, it's the, the basic one that you've seen all over the place. It uses Impair Brigades, uses Impair Enforcers, and some buying uh, some synergy. Uh, recently, I think uh, the seven strength gold card was put in, and I went ahead and did the same. I'm not that big a fan of it, but it, it is pretty powerful. Sometimes you can get like 17 worth of value out of it uh, with a top of like 19. And it is a pretty good control option, which is really nice. So as you can see, I went first. Did I go first? Yeah, I went first. Going first, and we're going up against a Dagon monster. So this is pretty bad for me. I don't want to go first, especially as Calvate, but especially against a weather deck like Dagon. Uh, it's a lot more difficult, or it's not necessarily a weather deck, it's a hybrid consume deck, but it's a little it's a lot more difficult because they can just dictate the control of the match, of course, like I've said a million times before. So it can be a little bit tricky. One of the big things I'm looking for is to as you see, I want to get the spine tag on him, and then I can use Menno later to get rid of it pretty easily. I did set it up a little bit early. I'm kind of threatening, and this is really unfortunate that that freaking Harpy out of the two units hit the one that was going to uh, allow him to feast on it. And that actually happened quite a few times in that, that day of playing with this John Kelby deck. They would somehow get one damage off of my Impair Enforcer and then eat it with Karen. Really annoying. So here, I'm not really doing too much. Uh, I don't think he has a lot of options that I want to hit. I think I could have waited for him to play another Rant Warrior, but it's not that big a deal. I'm just trying to look for a big unit to hit that isn't Rant Warrior because I, I have the option to just kill it. And now he's going to do the thing where it, it's just it's at the exact breaking point where he needs to get rid of that spine tag or else he's going to lose 16 worth of value, which is catastrophic and then i'm pretty safe to just go for a pass there with just one card down but with a lot of my good cards still left over and then i can just dictate the uh, the pacing and match of round two and then bleed out as much as i can from him so he needs to come up with a solution that allows him to keep his rain warrior while at the same time keeping this match going and if you've already played hybrid and tomb with or against it you know exactly what he's gonna do of course it's gonna be at kimara uh, i mean one of the two options. The other option would be to, to toggle the spine tag somehow, but he can't do that just yet. So I go ahead and I go put the spine tag back on it. And what he should have done here, he should have just passed. That's all he should have done, I think, in my opinion. Because then we go into round two and he's still one card up. While I'm still threatening not only his carryover, but a spine unit with 22 of uh, value. Unless he had a second Ekimar, then I can understand that. So he makes a pretty big mistake here. And I punished him pretty hard by killing him with Menno. And like I said, I get rid of both the point value and I get rid of his carryover and I can pass pretty safely with just going one card down. As opposed, if he had just done it one turn earlier, I would have had a less useful Menno. I would have been able to control round two a lot less and he doesn't get his carryover. So he made a bit of a mistake there. He was kind of threat. I, it's possible he knew I was 100% going to use Menno and he still wanted to try and bait it out, I guess. But considering the high point value of that and the carryover, like I said three times already, it's not really worth baiting out Menno in that situation. You want the opponent, the opposing player to go for a much less valuable uh, trade there. And I'm in a really good position to just do whatever I need to do to win. <laughs> that was a really dumb way of saying that, but <laughs> because that's, that's very obvious. Uh, I make a mistake here. I should have gone for Ekimara. Oh, I did go for Ekimara. Okay, uh, one of the one of those games I was on like this exact situation. I picked up Harpy instead, uh, but Akimari gives you more carryover value. Uh, Harpies only give you two. This gives you at least six, or on average six. Four points may not seem like that big of a difference, but it does. A lot, lots of games come down to uh, sub five points. So he plays his Harpy, gets a little bit of carryover going. This is a perfect opportunity for me to pass because he has to play at least one more card. I could draw it a little, a little bit more to try and get some weather out of him. Um, but two things. One, I still have my mage, so I can just clear the weather next time. Uh, two, if he plays a card, if I play a card and then he plays a card that go over it, he doesn't have to play a card after that, and I would lose the card advantage I'm trying to get out of him. So by passing here, while we're still on the same card advantage, he's forced to play at least one more card. Now you're saying, why don't I just try pass? And that's totally something I could have done. 
But against this particular matchup, I don't necessarily want to do that because I want to try and draw some of those higher valuable cards and then pass maybe in the middle of a combo or something like that. Like maybe he plays one Vran Warrior and then I pass and he doesn't get the full value out of the second egg. That's what I was kind of looking for. But at the same time, I still have carryover, which is as if I played like point at like 0.5 to 0.75 of a play. Or rather, I played like 0.25 to 0.5 of a card as opposed to a full value of a card. Overall, I get more value out of this. Uh, really, he should have gone for a play that allowed him to pass my strength uh, value. But he still has a Necker, which, I mean, is fine for him. But if he had a, a bunch of consume cards, he could have just saved it and then uh, pull him out, all out on round three. And that may have actually been the mistake that loses him the game. Oop, spoiler. <laughs> but yeah, that's what happens. Of course, this is certainly a lot to go up against. I go for and get rid of Yakim because I had Rain Farm, which I'm going to pull with that. So the point of this game was to just examine like the the ways you can just like explode with value, like in just a very short amount of plays, and making sure to set up beforehand so that you can take advantage of all that tempo. Now, if you played this deck, you know exactly what's coming up, which is really fun. It's also really really gross. I'll go ahead and speed this up a little bit so we can get to that point. Plays Woodland Spirit. Now, I don't want to use my mage just yet. I want him, especially since this Ekimar is going to die with only one strength left anyway. So I'm going to hold on to my mage, wait for him to get rid of Dagon. That's an example in which using Dagon first is good because then you can bait your opponent into using their weather clear prematurely. Because now I know, I have a guarantee that he has a second weather that I may want to clear. And now he's going to use the Dagon to use the fog to kill the to try and kill the rain uh, Imperial Enforcer. Okay, and then this is a pretty good opportunity for me to use my Weather Clear. It's not a hundred percent necessary to use in this instance because uh, I'm not clearing anything off the Range Row, and I'm not really going to play anything in there anyway. But this still clears the ten-ish points worth of weather, whereas my other option is something like Over Overdrive. Is it called overdrive or over something which would only get on average maybe like six to ten so it's basically this doing the same thing also this keeps my imperial enforcer or imperial enforcer uh enforcer a little bit healthier which is always good yeah i kept it out of being dying to that now you say well okay so it's another weather why don't you just wait a little bit longer but the thing is he's not gonna do that he's not gonna play three what uh Three weathers in all three rows. It's just not going to happen. So we're using that mage with the two weathers is just fine. And getting hit by range isn't too big of a deal anyway. It's a lot easier to play around against something like that instead of something else that can like kill or uh, weaken specifically. target A targeted weaken. As far as going for these shots are going, uh, where I'm trying to place these shots, I'm trying to hit them on units with more than one point of strength because I want to be able to get as many points as I possibly can because I'm pretty behind by this point. And here it goes for the uh, Ekimaru into his Necker, I think. Oh yeah, that's right. I was like, you should you should take the the Wyvern and then you can hit my Imperial Enforcer and then it's almost a guarantee that you you kill it, right? That. <laughs> that would have that would have lost me the game this is another critical mistake that he makes he, he should be what when you have rain like that that is hitting two random units like that you can almost guarantee that it's going to hit it down to three and since wyvern does another three you can guarantee effectively guarantee that you kill the imperial enforcer which is only going to scale with value over the course of this match in fact I am 100% certain he would have won this game if he had just played the Wyvern. And I'm trying to direct him toward it. I don't know if the other player can actually see that. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, dude, you need to kill my Baron Enforcer. But now he goes for the Baron instead, which is a pretty big mistake. Also, he doesn't even use Ekimar in the Necker, which I thought was a little bit strange. He must have another way of trying to eat it. It possibly can't. It cannot be Brand Warrior because you would have played it earlier to try and get that Necker a little bit stronger before you actually end up eating it or whatever it is. So I play out my my spy, I play out my dude. I hit the spy because that was my only option. But if he had another unit that had a spying tag, I would have hit that instead. Or actually, does it matter? I guess it doesn't really matter that much. But yeah, that, it doesn't matter. Oh, he had another. He had the other necker in his hand. That's why I forget about that. 
That's pretty unlucky for him. But still, he has a ton of value over me. So going into this, I'm looking, what do I want to put back in my deck? I definitely want to put Roach back because I have another gold. And for the second card, I don't put anything back. That may have been a mistake. I may have wanted to put something else in there, but it's not too big of a deal. There wasn't anything critical that I was looking for, I don't think. Except for maybe uh, the Infiltrator. Yeah, I should, have put it, I should have put an Infiltrator back in the deck, but it's okay. So yeah, look at this tempo. So it's 34 to 68, two cards to one. Pretty difficult to, to pass. My Imperial Enforcer is still alive. It would have died if he had played the other card instead. And this is where things get crazy. So I play at the Roach, play out Joachim, put Joachim down. I'm just putting it on the, the melee row, but it doesn't make too big of a difference, I don't think. Pull out Kalak. Now I use Kalak. I use it to put an Emissary out. So I create an Emissary. I pull out my Vico Varo Medic because I want to pull out the, uh, the other spy from out of his graveyard because I know that there's one in there because I played it last or the previous rounds. I place it down. I go and I get my other emissary that's still left in my deck, place that down. And then finally, I go for a pair brigade to take advantage of all those spies that I just got out. That's incredible levels of value right there. And just in case I put in the range row. Just in case he has like a Marigold Tailstorm or something. So I can just go ahead and kill the bear, even though it doesn't make too big of a difference. Oh, so, so it was, was it... One, two, three, four spies, which turns into eight here, turns into eight here, and then it turned into eight here. So eight times three is 24 minus 15, 13. So I got 13 extra value in addition to playing out the cards that I did on my side. Pretty incredible. And I still have the opportunity to do more as well. So he's still ahead of me by, by a little bit, but it doesn't matter because I have Vilgeforts. And since he actually just somehow managed to sn uh, snipe my Vicovar Medic, I'd use Dunk Covey instead. Making sure not to use the Impair Enforcer. I would have used Roached or the Mage before I used Impair Enforcer because I could have more spies. And I end up and I just get my last uh, Nazika Brigade and kill off that Joachim. For a pretty grand finish. Now, he, granted, he did make some mistakes and he did make some, uh, got some unlucky plays. But the whole point is that I set up my units in such a way that it took advantage of this huge power spike off of all these spies that I played in a single turn. Now, it was a little bit risky since my Imperial Force could have died, but I still would have won anyway. I was mistaken earlier. I said 100% I was going to lose if he had done that, but I guess that's not the case. I thought it was a little bit closer than this, but it's still really close. So that's the thing. It's the setup, and then it's the knockdown, and it's the making sure to keep all my the cards that I really wanted at the very end, like Rainfarn and Vilgefort, uh, and knowing like combos like uh, Vilgefort. I mean, uh, Vigovar Medic, uh, Vigovar Medic to pull up more spies, and then using Kalak to pull more spies. The whole thing was to use spies to get big power spikes off the combos that I had already set up in place. And also keeping in mind, I didn't let round two go out too far because I wanted to be able to do something like this. Also, if we had gone down to the wire in round two and then he played like a Necker or something that was like, you know, 13 strength and then he just pulls out another one and or even three into round or pulls out two into round three, I 100% would have lost. So I set myself in such a way that didn't allow that for that to happen. So kind of some nuances, some, you know, combo setup. It's all pretty, you know, straightforward, but, you know, always helps to have it talked out. And thank you for watching.